This one was a challenge. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today's video is sponsored by BetterHelp and we will be taking a look at Downshiftology. But first, let me tell you about my sponsor, BetterHelp. So as you guys know, I have been very open about my struggles with anxiety for pretty much my whole life. And as we're gonna discuss today, stress and anxiety play a really important role in physical health as well as mental health. So I've been really focusing on my mental health and working with a registered therapist is key to supporting my goals. So I recently discovered BetterHelp, which is the world's largest online therapist network with over 20,000 licensed professional therapists. It's not a crisis line or a self-help line. It's professional therapy done securely anywhere, anytime online. The way it works is that you just log into your account any time of day and you can send a message to your therapist and you get a timely response without needing to wait weeks between appointments. I know how important this is because obviously we can't plan out when we're gonna have like a panic attack or we're gonna have an anxious episode to have it coincide the week of our scheduled appointment. It's also a lot more affordable than traditional in-person therapy and there's also financial aid available for those in need. So if you're struggling with your mental health, check out betterhelp.com slash Abby's Kitchen to get 10% off of your first month of therapy. That's better H-E-L-P and you can join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. And you can pause the screen or look at the description to check out my general disclaimer, including a trigger warning to those with current or previous experiences with disordered eating. And if you are not already subscribed, hit that subscribe button and don't forget to follow me over on TikTok and Instagram at Abby's Kitchen. Today's video is going to be a journey we're about to go on together. I have been requested so many times to tackle Downshiftology, which is a popular meal prep channel brought to us by food blogger Lisa Bryan. And the reason I have admittedly waited up until now is that Lisa's case is probably one of the most unique and more complicated cases that I've seen here on YouTube. So after being diagnosed with four autoimmune diseases, Lisa decided to change up her eating habits and lifestyle in an effort to improve her symptoms while also inspiring her audience with her autoimmune friendly recipes and meal prep videos. So cases like these are quite complex for us dietitians because we have to very carefully investigate how each of the disease recommendations overlap or contradict each other while also paying attention to the individual's unique experience. But when people watching at home follow a cookie cutter recommendation that they see from like a wellness content creator, I feel that they risk very, very dangerous consequences for their own unique case. So after a lot of research and a large team effort, you and I are about to go through this case together. Honestly, even I'm a little shook. Let's get to it. My test results came back and I was off the charts for celiac disease. From there, the autoimmune connection was discovered and the diagnosis seemed to roll right in one after the other with Hashimoto's, psoriasis, and endometriosis. Yeah, like the girls got a lot going on. So in order to understand Lisa's case, let's break down, first of all, what an autoimmune disease actually is. Simply put, an autoimmune disease is a condition where the immune system attacks part of the body that it mistakes as foreign, even though they are otherwise perfectly healthy cells. This results in an inflammatory response, which increases inflammation in the body, along with other symptoms that are generally related to the part of the body that is being attacked. <laughs> So in Lisa's case with Hashimoto's disease, the immune system is attacking the thyroid, psoriasis attacks skin cells, celiac attacks part of the GI tract, and endometriosis affects cells of the uterus. Now, though it's technically not classified as an autoimmune disorder, endometriosis will usually fall into this category because it is inflammatory in nature. Now, the exact causes of most autoimmune disorders are difficult to pin down, though genetics, diet, and stress are considered likely contributors. Now, what we do know is that it is very common for autoimmune disorders to overlap. And honestly, that makes for some much 
testing waters for diagnosis, proper treatment, and diet recommendations. I dropped about $200 on gluten-free packaged food to fill up my fridge and pantry. But instead of feeling better, I actually felt worse. And I triggered candida and SIBO. I'm sure from all of the sugars and starches that I was eating in those packaged foods that my body just wasn't used to. It completely threw off my gut microbiome. Okay, so if you haven't been following along with my SIBO saga, which you can watch right here, SIBO, AKA small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, is a condition where there's an excessive amount of bacteria in the small intestine resulting in bloating, gas, and other digestive symptoms, along with some symptoms like weakness and fatigue. Candida, on the other hand, is a fungal infection that gets triggered when the healthy bacteria in our body kind of gets disrupted or our immune system is compromised, which results in things like fatigue, UTIs, oral thrush, and also digestive distress. So yeah, lots of not so hot symptoms going on at once for this young woman. This must be very, very hard. Now, as for the gluten-free products triggering these conditions, I would say that's probably not what's going on. I mean, it is possible that some gluten-free products have more triggering ingredients like starchy corn or tapioca, simple sugars or gums, which may exacerbate symptoms or kind of like feed the bacteria or yeast, but I did a brainstorm sesh with my colleagues on this, and what we think is a more likely explanation is that Lisa probably already had SIBO and Candida to begin with, but her celiac symptoms kind of masked their existence. So removing the gluten resolved some of those symptoms to allow others to become more obvious. Is it that obvious? I'm sorry. And I know it can feel like you take one step forward just to take two steps back. So where did the SIBO likely come from? Well, 50% of folks with celiac also have SIBO, likely because celiac and Hashimoto's often slow down gut motility. So essentially food is moving slower through the digestive tract. And the longer food particles, AKA bacteria fuel are like hanging around in the gut, the greater risk for bacterial overgrowth. As for the candida, because celiac damages the intestinal lining, it can impair the immune system, which makes it more likely for bacteria to kind of get out of control and trigger candida. Now, candida is also associated with Hashimoto's, possibly because the immune system may mistake the thyroid gland for an existing candida infection and essentially launch an attack. Another theory is that candida may cause leaky gut, AKA intestinal permeability, which is where the lining of the gut gets damaged and undigested food particles and toxins are able to leak through and enter the bloodstream. This can then trigger an inflammatory response and everything else kind of just snowballs from there. So with my investigative dietitian hat on, when I piece these puzzle pieces together, I can see that least conditions likely feed into one another in some sort of way. And while it can be a bit of a chicken and egg situation, we do know that solving this puzzle likely comes down to the integrity of the gut, more specifically intestinal permeability and an impaired migratory motor complex. Let me break it down. So as I mentioned, because the gut is weakened by celiac or candida, it can cause intestinal permeability and the leaking of contents into the bloodstream to trigger a system systemic inflammatory response. And I think a lot of Western medicine practitioners still dismiss intestinal permeability or leaky gut because it's not yet a real medical diagnosis. And honestly, I'm often tempted to do so as well because wellness influencers love to just chalk everything up to leaky gut. But it is an actual phenomenon with clinical markers that is acknowledged in the research. It's just not likely the root problem that so many health gurus claim it to be for everything. As for the other piece or the migratory motor complex I mentioned or MMC. So we know that Hashimoto's and celiac both can slow down gut motility, which may impair the MMC. So if you recall from my SIBO saga, the MMC acts as like this big broom to kind of sweep bacteria and food particles along the intestine. So not having an adequate or strong enough MMC allows bacteria to basically hang out there and pool and populate in the bowel, which can trigger things like SIBO. So bottom line, we got to heal that 
gut. And I really evaluated what I was putting into my body and how I was living my life. I swapped processed foods for whole nutrient dense foods. I focused on reducing stress, improving sleep, and prioritizing self-care. Almost all of the symptoms that I had had for decades started to vanish in the following weeks and months, including the allergies, the fatigue, the eczema, the constipation, and the chronic colds. Okay, so this is very interesting. So I liaised with my dietitian colleague, Dasha Eknulik, about this case. And she said her first goal in a situation like this would be to lower the chronic inflammation and get the gut in check to help downregulate the autoimmune response. So one strategy for lowering chronic inflammation is to evaluate what Dasha calls the speed pillars, which stands for sleep, personal stress, environmental stress, exercise, and diet. So while most wellness influencers would pull up a list from Dr. Google of all the foods to eliminate, we need to first determine the stressors that are likely triggering the inflammation in the first place. As per the speed pillars, it makes tons of sense to me that improving sleep and stress management help to reduce Lisa's symptoms, especially considering that she was functioning in a perpetual state of burnout all throughout her 30s, as so many of us are. As for dietary recommendations for autoimmune disorders, it is unfortunately not as cut and dry as prescriptive advice like get enough sleep or reduce stress. In general, it is highly, highly individualized as there's limited research and a ton of nuance that we need to be sensitive to. In fact, someone could have the exact same conditions as Lisa and require a completely different protocol. So with celiac disease, we need to completely get rid of all the gluten. So that means no wheat, rye, barley, malt, or triticale. With Hashimoto's disease, some folks may do well on a gluten-free diet, where others find that gluten-free grains trigger them even more. But the focus should be on nutrients for thyroid function like iodine, zinc, vitamin D, magnesium, selenium, and iron. I have a whole video on this that you can check out right here. Psoriasis is another mixed bag with very little quality research and no standard diet protocol. The evidence for gluten-free is admittedly mixed and inconclusive, but we do want to focus on getting enough omega-3 fats, vitamin D, selenium, and probiotics with some research to support the use of a Mediterranean style diet. And endometriosis is another bag of tricks. But the focus is on reducing trans fats and red meat with some folks feeling better going gluten-free. And of course, also we want to focus on increasing antioxidant rich fruits and vegetables, fiber, and omega-3s to help reduce pain and inflammation. Now, if I am overwhelmed just trying to communicate this, I can only imagine how Lisa is managing. So with that said, what would be my approach in a highly complicated scenario like this? Well, I would say this is a case where an already supervised elimination diet is warranted to really get symptoms under control, after which foods would be gradually reintroduced to track symptoms and also better identify the inflammatory triggers. So Lisa said she tried the whole 30 diet, which appeared to work for her. However, someone else with endometriosis may not tolerate Whole30, as it is typically higher in histamines, which may increase estrogen levels. On the other hand, some folks may benefit from the autoimmune protocol diet, which similar to Whole30, has very limited research to support its use. However, I did find one small study on 16 women with Hashimoto's who followed the AIP diet for 10 weeks, and inflammation did decrease by 29%, while disease-related symptoms decreased by 68%. Other elimination protocols like DASH's core perform method combine a variety of dietary approaches in one, such as the low FODMAP, low histamine, Whole30, Paleo, and AIP to better tease out trigger foods for complicated cases like this. So again, there is high, high variability here, and one protocol may work for one person and may not work for someone else. But the ultimate and eventual goal here is to actually eliminate as few foods as possible, since diet variety is also very important for the microbiome, which we also need to support. This is why it is just as important to focus on what we can add by integrating more anti-inflammatory foods. Luckily, the research is more aligned in this area when it comes to treating autoimmune disorders. So for example, we want to prioritize things like omega-3 fats, vitamin D, probiotics, and antioxidant-rich foods. 
These foods have also been shown to benefit the gut barrier function, which would simultaneously target the intestinal permeability piece. And Lisa has certainly gotten the anti-inflammatory memo because she incorporates a wide variety of anti-inflammatory foods in her diet pretty much every day. We also want to once again pay attention to the speed pillars and ensure that we're tending to our self-care to really target the stressors that may be perpetuating some of the inflammatory response. And it does sound like these lifestyle factors are top of mind for Lisa as well, because she breaks it all down in her healthy habits video right here. So taking a two pronged approach that A, lowers inflammation and B, improves gut health is in my professional opinion, the best strategy for chronic condition cocktails like this. And if you've taken away anything from this video is that you should never copy the nutrition protocol of somebody that you watch online. Always speak to a trained dietitian and healthcare need about your case. And yes, that was a lot. So on that note, that is all that I have for you guys today. Thank you again to BetterHelp for sponsoring. If you like this video, be sure to give it the thumbs up, leave me a comment below and subscribe to this channel and I will see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.